This episode is sponsored by Midnight Tales, a collection of short stories by author Duke C. Internet, I told you last week, and I'm going to tell you again about this brother Duke C. Okay? If you've ever been a creative, ever been somebody who wanted to get your project off the ground, you want other people to hear you, okay? I fuck with this dude, man. And if you fuck with the Premium Pete Show, it's 99 cents. Head on over to Amazon right now. Type in Midnight Tales space Duke C. It'll come up, okay? You download it to your phone or your desktop. Whatever it is, it's 99 cents. Come on. What are you going to do with 99 cents? And it's a one-quick purchase. So you order a book one quick. You want to order more? You can give a gift. Give a couple of gifts. Let me tell you something. I always say tell a friend to tell a friend. Well, send a book to a friend. Let them read. Ain't nothing better than, than, than supporting somebody. And look, I said, if you support me, then support this good brother, Duke C. Head on over to Amazon, Kindle, Amazon, whatever it is in the search bar. Put in Midnight Tales, Duke C. You'll see the book come up. It's 99 cents. Fuck with it. Thank you, Internets. You know what? Rate the brother, too. Leave a comment. Why not? Cheer. Internets, we back for another episode. That's right. And before we get into it, I want to say, listen, shouts to everybody who checked out last week's episode with the return, three-time returning ep- episode of Andrew Schultz and the first time Andrew Schultz ever met Dallas Penn. Super funny, super uh, uh, politics, super comedy, super life lessons. And as always, in every episode, we try to make sure there's a gem because that's really what matters, man. Trying to give something to somebody, not just you listening to some shit, but where you gain something out of it. Come on, man. We're not fucking around now. But let me tell you something. I really want to give a big shout out to my father, man. Papa Premium, man. He just celebrated a birthday. It's a good man right there. You know what I spoke about when I posted his picture on IG? And for those of you who don't know, but uh, this year has been a tough year with Pops. Uh, you know, found out he had prostate cancer and, uh, you know, battling that and really like just a dude that really never complains. I, I never heard him complain. I never heard him blame anybody. I never heard him like point the finger or just, just, just try to use an excuse to do power through. I uh, went through a lot of radiation, a lot of treatment. And, uh, you know, he's getting better. And, and that's what I like to see for a while. I, I was very worried and I made sure that I went and go visit him a lot because, uh, you know, it took a lot out of him. But Papa, Papa Premium's kicking another year around the sun. Another year around the globe. And, uh, you know, it's funny, too, because Pop Duke's growing up. And some of you know, if you're listening, you know, just starting to listen to the show now, you may not know. But, uh, you know, growing up, Pop Duke's worked three jobs. I hardly never seen him. Never really hung out with him a lot. He wasn't that dude that just went out and played baseball with me and catch and shit. Uh, he was working. And, 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 you know, it's crazy because it's like you don't get a relationship with your pops. But at the same time, he's trying to raise the family. So, you know, it's, it's it's a tough aspect to look at it like that. But internet, let me tell you something. You don't really, you don't ever get to choose your father. You get one father, man. So, you know, if he's not that much of a fucky bird, man, send him a text right now or, or shoot him a tweet. Or if he's on Facebook, you know, some dads be on Facebook flossing, um, look, look, looking for a new, new, new biddy. But who knows? You know what I mean? If they're happily married, look, just hit pops up. You know what I'm saying? And let him know how much you love him. Or let him know that he's appreciated. Or whatever it is, man. Try and build on that relationship if it ain't that good. Because you pop, you only have one pops, man. And, and life don't last forever. And, and and that's why, like, look, you know, sometimes we do Pastor Pete. Sometimes we keep things going. But more importantly, like I said, when you listen to the Premium Pete show, you're going to hear people from all walks of life. But more importantly, you're not going to just hear their story and be like, wow, that's crazy. What you're going to hear is something like, wow, that's crazy. Maybe I could do that. Or, wow, maybe I could learn something. Or maybe, wow, you know, because, look, I'll be honest with you. One of the hardest things in life for me was to navigate through everything. One of the most powerful things for this podcast is to give people that tool. I'm just another piece of the puzzle, though. But I'll tell you one thing. When you think about it, I said this on Instagram the other day, and I want to let you all know for that are listening. It's funny how we outgrow what we once thought we couldn't live without, and then we fall in love with what we didn't even know we wanted. And that's why I will say life is is, is funny like that. I'm going to repeat that again for all you that, that said, oh, did he just try, try? Yeah, I did. It's funny how we outgrow what we once thought we couldn't live without. And then we fall in love with what we didn't even know we wanted. I mean, think about that for a second. But more importantly, as you think about it, I want to let you know something. If you're going through your week, your month, if the year started off rough for you, if you have a project that you're working on that's taking forever to get off the ground, and, and it's not working. Don't give up yet. Hang in there. I always, I always tell you, look, life, and here's another quote for you, okay? A premium P quote. Life is funny 
It'll throw you for a loop. Wait, actually, let me repeat that to you just so you understand. I tweeted this, okay? Make sure you look at my Twitter, look at my Instagram to get these gems. Life is funny. It'll throw you for a loop sometimes. Have you confused at times? Have you feeling like you're on top of the world? And some days question yourself why you're on top of the world. Never lose your focus and never let any of that make you give up on you or your dreams. Let me tell you something, Internet. <laughs> like I was saying, I want to repeat that one more time for you. Life is funny. It'll throw you for a loop sometimes. Have you confused at times? Have you feeling like you're on top of the world and some days questioning yourself why you're on top of the world? Never lose focus and never let any of that make you give up on you or your dreams. Trust me when I tell you, I'm not there yet. I'm working towards getting there. But I've been through many situations of up and down, of success and failures, and I'm telling you the most biggest thing that you could gain is patience. Be patient, but work hard. And shit will happen. may not happen overnight. Don't worry about it. Don't let other people dictate to you what they think success is. You'll get there in your own time, okay? Just stay fucking focused. And uh, have a good dinner once in a while and a good lunch. And try and catch a fucking power nap, okay? But more importantly, make sure you have a good fucking team around you, man. That's the thing I, people, I don't think people understand. When you have, like, a, a wife or a girlfriend or, 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 or somebody that really believes in you, man, that's a team. Because to, in order to start a company, any good company started, any good startup started, any good podcast started, was a team. Any, any good business started had a team, a team of people, whoever, somebody that did a, a graphic design, somebody that was just good at fucking uh, a wallpaper, somebody that was good at fucking putting up a shelf, or somebody that was good at social media. So respect your team. And help and help them elevate in whatever way you can. There's a lot of jobs out here, particularly even in podcasting. There's so many team members and 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 that people may not get paid, but pay them with value, pay them with a chance to learn. Let me tell you something. People say it all the time. Best best opportunity to ever get is networking, especially at a young age to meet people to build relationships. People will talk all the time how college sometimes is a waste, but the networking they got there took them into their next life. So you may not have to go to college for that. But understand, be around the team. I always say respect your team. But even if you're a regular kid, find a way how to fucking join a team. Find a way how to get into a fucking a job, a, a, a business, a podcast, a startup team, and make yourself useful. Don't worry about a fucking paycheck in the beginning. If you're young and you can fucking, so, so, you know, if you're eating crackhead soups and smoking weed and that's all you care about, fucking what the fuck are you worry about pay for? Make yourself useful. Make yourself, like, make people fucking know you're there. And also, at the same time, soak shit in. So, soak it up as a sponge, man. Real talk. But teamwork makes the dream work. I want to take this time right now to recognize some of my team. All my engine room family. All the engineers here. Okay? All the, all, all, all the different affiliates here at Engine Room Studios in New York City. Okay? I also want to shout out my guy, my, my right hand in this, Tigarachi Isaiah. Okay? I want to shout out my man Big Baller Benson, my man Noah from Down Hood, Katira, um, also Rob, I Write Films, my man Lou T, okay? Okay, there's a bunch of people, man. My man Will. Who else? Is, I, I don't want to forget all these people, man. That's the only thing I hate about shouting people out. I feel like you forget people. My man Sly Cuiano. Let me tell you. Man, I, man my man Calvin. My man Calvin, SGD Design. All those people make up producing, graphic design, videography. My man Danny SpaceXX, the photographer. Photography, fucking, like all those people help fucking create a team. Even if you don't know who the fuck they are, they're all a piece of the puzzle. Internets, appreciate the people around you, okay? And now you know what time it is. When I tell you to fucking check the fucking... You know what fucking time it is. Check the fucking. Grab your phone. Grab your desktop. Okay. Tweet at the Premium Pete Show. At, um, at Premium Pete. At Premium Pete Show. Check the fuck in. Yo, let me tell you something. Ever since I've been telling the internet to check in, I'm loving it. Okay. I already said it last week. Zimbabwe, Dallas, Queens, fucking Kansas City. Every week, different people. Even Detroit all the time. And let me tell you something. If you're checking in and you're from the same place you checked in last week, don't worry about it. Just add something to the sentence. Tell me what episode you like. 
Tell me what fucking what what, what what's good in your hood. What, what you eating out there? Whatever it is. At Premium Pete. At the Premium Pete Show. If you're listening right now, check the fucking. Tell me what's good. I want to talk to you, man. I want to know what's good. Tell me what episodes you're fucking with. Okay. And I always say this, and I'm gonna continue to say this. Continue suggesting an episode for people. If an entrepreneur, you know, that you know that could use some advice, suggest to him the Gary Vaynerchuk episode or the Jason Mading episode or the Josh Luber episode of today. I told you, sports, you know, Victor Cruz, Smush Parker, Rod Strickland. Come on, okay? We could keep on going down. Artistry, you got the rest in peace, my brother Prodigy, Styles P, you know, producing with Pete Rock, Buck Wow, Il Mai. Come on. Suggest an episode, the Premium Pete Show. Rate, leave a comment on iTunes. Dig, dig in the catalog. It's fucking. It, it, we're not gonna stop, okay? As always, as always, and giving a shout and remembrance, and we'll never forget our brother Reggie Ose, aka Combat Jack. Dig in the fucking catalog. There's content there. We're gonna raise the bar. Internet. This episode this week is special. Another one of those entrepreneurial stories. I got a chance to visit the headquarters of something I heard about before I even getting to visit. Many years ago, I know a kid named Josh Luber started this thing called Campless. Some fucking weird number number of research on sneakers. Years later, he becomes a business partner with billionaire Dan Gilbert and starts what we know the first ever stock traded company, StockX, with sneakers, now they have watches, they have Supreme and Bape. Anyway, Internet, let me tell you something. I was in the barber shop the other day, okay? And a motherfucker came in, and they were all talking about StockX. I was like, you're these young kids. I was like, fuck, this shit is fucking a phenomenon. Internet, we find out how he took a fucking data-driven sneaker site called Campus and turned it into the, the, the super popular StockX with the one and only billionaire Dan Gilbert. But more importantly, his struggles, his progress in starting startup companies, and how he was ready to quit it all. And it's like I said, I love these episodes that we go down the journey. I present to you the co-founder and CEO of StockX, Josh Luber, episode of the Premium Pete Show. Let's get to it. Cheer. Come on, everybody, get set, let's go. It's the next episode. It's the Premium Pete Show. News, interviews, all of the info. Listen up, it's the Premium Pete Show. If you want the scoop in the low, down low, listen to the show, cause milk said so. Fuck what you heard, better act like you know. It's the Premium Pete Show. Internet, and we're back with another episode of the Premium Pete Show. Sitting here with a very, very bright mind. Um, I, I can say so many different things about this uh, individual, but I will say this. I was out in Detroit recently, and I went downtown, and I went on this tour of downtown, which is being, um, I guess you could say, re- rebuilt by Dan Gilbert. And there's so many different things I've seen. I've seen just like businesses and and, and quicken loans and and but and one I seen that 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 I was proud to see that has grown and we're gonna get into it. Internet, this is to me another one of those entrepreneurial stories, and I can't wait to break it down. But we're sitting here with the one and only Josh Luber, CEO and co-founder of StockX. Right off the bat, before you even say hello or welcome or thank you for having me, what the fuck is StockX for people <sighs> listening that may not even know? <sighs> StockX is a stock market for consumer goods. Mm. And I totally get that 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 does not mean anything. And and it shouldn't at this point because it's totally unique and does not exist. But at the most fundamental level, it's a consumer marketplace, right? So think eBay. Mm. We are connecting buyers and sellers for someone to sell something to someone else and someone else to buy it. But everything of how it works is the same way that the stock exchange works. And there's a lot there, and we can unpack all of it and get into the details. But for lack of a less cliche way to say it, this is truly revolutionary. This doesn't exist yet, but there's some really, really basic logic that makes sense, right? The stock market has been one of the most efficient forms of commerce for hundreds of years, and it's never been applied to consumer goods, that model. And that's what we're trying to do. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, we're going to get to um, how that even was thought of, how it even started. But but even more so, StockX is selling sneakers. So you really could get Yeezys or Jordans or, like, you know, ex- explain how that process works. Right. And it's, it's not just uh, buying stock right, of, right. of the sneaker. Yeah. That's fair, right? All right. So, and, and we started with sneakers and sneakers is still the large majority of our business we've started to expand to other products and and we can talk about that but um to your point it is not about buying stock in a pair of sneakers it is still like ebay about that seller selling a physical good take it a a pair of yeezys and that buyer wanting to buy that pair of yeezys and and he buys it right so give the breakdown of like Mm -hmm. what StockX does like somebody goes on there and buys or sells. Like, give an example for the buyer and seller. Like, what StockX is the liaison? Sure. So there's a few parts. When, when we talk about it as a stock market, what we really mean is the method by how the stock market connects buyers and sellers. Right. We want to bring together a buyer and seller for that person to sell someone else a pair of views. So. There's three fundamental parts of of how that works and why it's different. So first of all, it's anonymous. You go on eBay and you want to buy a, a pair of Yeezys, you will, you will see thousands of people selling it, and you will choose, do I buy Yeezy from that guy, or from that guy, or from that guy? You buy a share of Apple stock on the New York Stock Exchange, there's one ticker symbol for that, and that's completely anonymous. There's no one telling you who's selling it on the other end. By the way, there is a single person who is selling you that share of Apple stock, but you don't know who that is, and you don't care. So start with the fact that you have a pair of Yeezys that is listed on StockX, Buy a seller, but it's anonymous. All you see is the price for that. You don't see who's selling it. And that's a good thing. It takes away all the noise and all the nonsense of trying to figure out, is this guy legit? Where are they located? How many reviews do they have? How many sales do they have? So all you see is you're buying a pair of Yeezys. So that's first. So it's anonymous. Mm-hmm. The second is authentic. right? So after that sale happens, you choose to buy that pair of Yeezys. It gets shipped to us in Detroit. And we authenticate it, make sure that it's real, it's the right product, it hasn't been worn, and then we ship it to the buyer. So in that regard, we are making sure that it is real, that it is authentic, that you're never going to get a fake pair of Yeezys. Is that a long process by them shipping it to you and then them having to ship it to somebody else? So when we started, that was a big concern. It was a big concern about the time that it would take because, man, people want their Yeezys now. Sure. The reality is it only adds about two to three days max. Right, Because once we get it, we turn it that same day. Anything that comes in that morning gets authenticated and back in the mail that evening. Mm. Right, So it's really only that extra two days for that seller to get it to us. But what we found is that people value that authenticity and that process in the middle, that they're willing to wait those extra two days versus eBay and not have to worry about getting a fake. Mm. Well, we're going to bounce around and we're going to learn about this uh, empire that you're building that is really growing rapidly. It's amazing to even see. Like, I, <laughs> It's funny because I, I remember when you just started. And, I mean, we'll go back. It was even before StockX. But, um, all right, let's go all the way back, actually. You grew up in Philadelphia, yep. right? Mom and dad? Yep. What, what I got to know what mom did and I got to know what dad did because you are, are somebody that has not only... What I learned, too, is that you did a bunch of startups before you did this. So your mind had to be ticking. What the fuck did mom do? What did dad do? Uh, my father was a lawyer. My father was a lawyer. Uh, my mother was the office manager at a dentist office. Mm. Well, later on, did your father become your lawyer? Uh, yeah, and multiple times uh, throughout my uh, my career, he acted as my lawyer, uh, free of charge. That's dope. Uh, it works out really well <laughs> when other people have to pay for, for legal expenses. So, sure. yeah, that helped. So you grew up in Philadelphia. I grew up in Philly. How was that? Um, it was good. Look, I grew up in the suburbs. I um, actually grew up in um, in a town called Penn Valley, which is um, my high school was right down the street from Lower Marion High School, which is most notable for where Kobe went. Mm. And Kobe was a year uh, younger than me. And like just about everyone my age in, in sneakers, I grew up playing basketball when Jordan played. I always wanted Jordans. My mother never buy me Jordans. And so for that neighborhood and for where we were, it was all about basketball. And then it was amplified when Kobe was in the neighborhood and and Kobe was playing basketball. So that was really a big part of of growing up. It was just, it was basketball. Now, so you're, say you're in high school. What the fuck did you want to be? Uh, what every um, you know, white Jewish kid on the basketball kid wanted to be. I wanted to be in the NBA, but <laughs> that 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 got killed really quickly. Um, you know, it's interesting when I look back now, right? Because back then, so I'm uh, I'm turning forty in a couple of weeks. Um, 
the word entrepreneur, yeah, um, the word entrepreneur didn't exist, mm-hmm. right? Um, startups didn't exist, you know, not in the same way that that they do now, right? I mean, I was in high school, nineteen ninety five, right? I mean, the internet was just starting, sure. not what it is today. But when I look back at it. I collected baseball cards. That's the first job. I used to sell chewing gum in school, and then I sold candy, right? You like have all these like little like side hustles that are just small businesses, right? My the first business I ever ran was in sixth grade. I used to hop the fence behind my house and go to the supermarket and buy four packs of gum for a dollar, and then sell them for twenty five cents a piece, mm. and so I could make five dollars on four packs of gum for a dollar, and that was my first business. Mm. And who, where did you come to think of that? Why gum? Like, where did that come from? It's what kids in school wanted, man. Kids wanted gum. And I don't know. One day I figured out that I, I could sell them. By the way, the, the end to that business was hysterical because what had happened was I'd built up this inventory of gum and I had this, like, uh, brown shopping bag in my locker. And, um, and this kid wanted me to give him a, a piece of gum. And I was like, it's a quarter, right? There's no free gum. Didn't understand seating at the time, right? I should have been giving this kid free gum. He steals the bag and runs down the hall and gets like a teacher sort of, you know, picks him up for running in the hall, looks in the bag, finds 132 packs of gum and confiscated all of it because you can't have gum in school. That's that's how that business ended. But, you know, for a while it was fun. What the fuck can you have gum in school for? I, you know, <laughs> some of these rules we had growing up were, were definitely... Uh... Man, definitely uh, stupid, in, you know, in my opinion. You so, think there'd be more important things to, hey, to worry about, for right? For sure. Yeah. So now mom and dad mm-hmm. stayed together? Yeah. Now, So mm-hmm. so them being there mm-hmm. obviously was a help to you. Yeah, look, I mean, education and grades, and I mean, that was all important, absolutely, growing up. That was that was a big part of it. So you, you finished high school. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever find any other um, startups? Um, yeah. Um, you know, the... The first true startup I ran was um, a year after I graduated college. Um, so I went to college at Emory in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And after college, I worked for a furniture store. And I worked at a furniture company called Nationwide Warehouse. And I, was, uh, I worked in merchandising at Nationwide Warehouse. And the company went through bankruptcy and laid off uh, pretty much everyone in the company. And when it came time to, to lay me off, and they brought me in the office and told me I was being laid off. And then they explained to me unemployment. And I never worked before, and I never knew about it. And I said, hold up. So I get $323 a week for the next six months for doing nothing? So I was like, fuck yeah. I'm like, this is awesome. So <laughs> I spent two days, or I basically spent two days partying. And then about on the third day, friend of mine said, hey, you know that business idea you had? Like, why don't you do it now? Your life is fun. I could live off of 323 a week easy at that point in my life. I said, start this. And the idea was, and so this was uh, 2001, 2000 in Atlanta. And the idea was essentially home computer consulting, right? So this was before Geek Squad, but the idea of going into people's houses and helping them learn how to use their computers. And by the way, I am not a computer guy, but we had a friend that was within our sort of like group of friends at the time sure. who was a, a uh, he was a computer guy and he had gotten laid off from his job. And so he was starting to go around our neighborhood in Atlanta, putting like flyers in people's mailboxes saying, you know, Emory student, you know, $50 an hour, help you with your computer. And he built up this little business and we looked into it and there was no companies that did this. And this seemed like a pretty logical thing. Like, why doesn't the company do this? So that was the first business. It was home computer consulting, where we would go out and we would get Georgia Tech students, right? And Georgia Tech has a phenomenal computer engineering program. And we would get these kids who were in school at Georgia Tech who were way overqualified to go into people's houses and fix their computer. And my job was to to manage the business, to find the customers and schedule out these kids to go into people's houses. Mm-hmm. And so that was the first business. Like a dispatcher. It, I was I was essentially the dispatcher. Find find the customer, manage the con, the consultants, and send them out to to do the work. Did it do well? It um, the it's really defined depends how you define well. So first of all, it one hundred percent solidified that this is what I wanted to be doing in my life. I worked more than I ever worked. And I, mean, I literally ran the business out of my bedroom and worked nonstop and barely made enough money to live. But 100%, I was like, I need to be doing this. I need to be starting businesses and running business. And the process of creating it was like, absolutely, this is what I need to be doing. Eventually, um, I sold that business. It was a 
a very small sale. It was certainly not a, but it, it was nice to get a couple of hours and put in my pocket as we sort of wound down this business. It was a service business. There was, it was never going to really scale to be this big business because you got to just keep getting consultants and keep sure, sending them sure. out there. But it solidified that this is what I wanted to do. So yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the true win that came out of it. You know, you went to Emory College, right? You're an entrepreneur. I mean, they didn't have that before, but you're an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Entrepreneur. Hey, man, what am I? I can't even talk now. You're an entrepreneur. Do you believe college was worth going? Hundred percent. But for me, it was about um, it was about the sort of maturation of of living on your own and managing yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, would I have ended up in the same place had I gone? I mean, Emory was an expensive private school and took out a lot of loans, and it took me many years to pay them back. Um, would I have ended up in the same place had I gone to a school that was a state school or somewhere else? Probably, right? But that process was absolutely um, fundamental in in creating that. And also, and I look back now, the the amount of networking that's come out of that as that network grew from college, and I went to, to graduate school. I was a JD MBA, right? So I spent a lot of time and money at Emory. And, um, and I, it's certainly not for everyone. And today, I don't know if I would answer it the same way as I did in, from 1995, but for me, it was. For me, it Why was. Why did you go to graduate school? Mm-hmm. So I was in the process of, of running this company. The company was called Tech Experts. That was the, the home computer consulting company. And, um, and I was always interested in going back to business school. I mean, that was sort of where my, my head was at. Um, and I, I swear to God, I had this. So everyone in my family, everyone in my life was a lawyer. My father, my best friends from school, my best friends from, from, um, uh, from college, from high school. So there was a lot of lawyers in my life, and I never had any interest in law at all. And then when I was working at this furniture company that went through bankruptcy, bankruptcy is the, the merging of business and law. And all of a sudden, I was right in the middle of this very super interesting – I mean, look, bankruptcy is bad for a lot of reasons, but it's really fascinating to be a part of this. And that was the thing that gave me this interest of the merging of business and law. And I was going back to, to get uh, to business school anyway and almost at the last minute decided that I would sort of look into law school. And I was able to do both degrees in a short period of time. And so that was the, that was the plan. You know, with lawyers – a lot of people say they're different type of people. You know, back with uh, your relationship with your father, the, the, do you feel like lawyers were able to be like, well, your father was a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like he was very, to be like very lovable with you? A hundred percent. Okay. Right. But do you understand what I mean? Cause For sure. Yeah. But, but right. Um, we, there was, there was a part, there was almost two separate parts, right? There was, as a father, he was phenomenal and lovable and like that. But when we were in like sort of, call it work mode, whether it's school. I mean, he was very analytic around when I got punished, what I had to do is write essays and then he would edit the essays. Right. And then I'd have to rewrite them. It was literally like teaching me how to write. And I, and I actually became yeah, a, a yeah, phenomenal sure. writer because of that. And I'm absolutely doing that to my kids. Right. But like, that was the level of, because, you know, the legal profession is a very written analytic profession where it's about words and writing and that's where it's at. And so from a very cerebral place where, so there was a love part, absolutely hundred percent. But like when it was in that area, oh man, it was, and I'd end up with essays that I'd turn into like my third grade teacher that I was embarrassed. I'm like, dad, there's no way she's going to believe that I wrote this. Right. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, you did. He's like, we took, and I was like, whatever. Right. You, you do it. But like, that was part of it. So <laughs> now, yeah. I, you know, I, I love to find out those things because, you know, just from knowing lawyers, sometimes they're, they're just, I mean, they're a very smart breed, but they just move sometimes very weird, you know, like with people, you know, a hundred percent, man. So, but you know, mm-hmm. it's a great question. No, listen, you, you, the next steps of getting into what you have done, um, to me, I spoke to you about was right timing, but more importantly, you know, just doing something that nobody was doing. I think in this day and age, so many people do the same thing. I always give people examples when I was in retail and we were taking like consignment brands, um, clothing. People would call and say, hey, Premium Pete, but yeah, what's up? They're like, hey, uh, we're trying to get our clothes, our brand in, 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 in your store. Okay, uh, what's the name of you guys? Oh, we're just like LRG. I was like, well, I already got LRG. What the, what, why would I want you? So I feel like so many people don't take the chance to go left. Now, I just want to make sure I'm in the right position of your life at this time. 
You, did, you went to IBM beforehand or, or during? Before campus? Yeah, yeah. I started campus while I was at IBM. So is the next steps campus of getting out of college? or? Yeah, so basically, so I, I went to grad school. Um, I, I, I actually worked as a lawyer for about a year coming out of uh, grad school because they pay really well as a first-year associate. And... Um, and you can't really go back and do that, right? They hire people who are coming right out of law school. So I did that, but the entire time I was at this law firm, I was working on a business on the side. Um, this was a company that was called Servinity, and it was essentially like scheduling for restaurants. So how does a restaurant manage their staff who maybe at any given time you have 20% of the people that work there are working that shift, and everywhere else is somewhere else, right? They work sure. other shifts and how you manage that. There's a lot of reasons why that company didn't work out, um, namely because we started in 2007 before the iPhone existed, and today that would be an app. And we were trying to build a web product, and, sure, sure. and a lot of reasons why it didn't work out. But essentially what happened is when I shut down that company, I went and took the job and moved to New York and worked for IBM. Mm -hmm. So how was IBM? How was it even working for IBM? So I never thought I would go work for IBM. I never thought I'd go work for a big company. I shut down the last startup. I shut down Servinity, and a classmate of mine from business school said, hey, I heard you shut down Servinity. You should come work with me at IBM. And I said, bro, I was like, I don't think you get it. I was like, my company has four people. IBM has 400,000. Like, I'm good. And this was 2009, pretty much the worst job market of, of our life. And, and he said, no, listen, you know, this is different. It's a good group. Come talk to some people. And one conversation leads to another and leads to another. And um, and it was a really good opportunity. And I went and worked for an, uh, an internal strategy group. I was essentially a consultant. And most consultants have to live on the road and spend all their time traveling. And this was an opportunity to be a consultant and do really high-level consulting work but not have to travel. I just had to move to New York. And I was like, done. Right? I get to go move it, to live in New York, which I'd always wanted to do. And, um, and I get to do some really interesting business work. Sure, sure. But what very quickly happens when you go and work for a big company, uh, when you're a startup guy, is as soon as you get there, you start working on stuff on the side. And that's really how this happened is I was at IBM. I was doing a lot of data work as consultants do. I mean, literally, I, I went from I barely knew how to use Excel to being knee deep and, and becoming somewhat of an expert in, in data work. Um, and as I was doing that and looking for side projects, the thought was, you know, I wonder if I get all some sneaker data just to play with my own amusement, just to see what I could do with it. Because, you know, I've collected sneakers since I was eight. So it was this merges. And it was also really good timing because the, these thoughts started happening right around the end of 2011. So Concord release, which, you know, was the first sort of really big bringing sneakers into mainstream, right? Right as Instagram was having its own moment and really having their own growth after Facebook had bought Instagram. And then February 2012, and you have Galaxy Foam and, and that whole release. So there was this really interesting of the sneaker world becoming more mainstream and me looking for a side project and saying, well, you know what? I was like, there's no price guide for sneakers. There was no true data-driven price guide. And so that was the, I was like, oh, I do all this data work at IBM. I wonder if I could get a hold of some sneaker data and, and create a price guide. You name it campus. What the fuck does that mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, so we started this, and I started looking through every sneaker blog and sneaker site. And as you know, it was kick this, sole this, flip this, right? Like there literally was not something that didn't have sneakers, sole, kick, flip, or something. And I was like... There is no way I am going to create any business and put one of those words in it and then have to deal with trying to cut through the clutter of it. I was like, I need to come up with a name that doesn't have any of those words in it, and I either build a brand around it or I don't. But there's no way I was going to be, you know, sole price guide or something like sure, that, right? Sure. And so it was literally a play on, um, you know, on, on people camping out. So our tagline, since we're a data company, was no more camp less. Mm, right, mm, as people mm, are, are outside info, yeah, camping sure. out for sneakers. So, basically, so let me give you my example of when I first seen it. When I mm -hmm. first seen, it, I was like, "What the fuck is this?" But it was fascinating to know, and even telling people to today is is fascinating to know. We really didn't know the price guide for like how many pairs were sold here, how much is the highest it was sold for, how much was the lowest it was sold for, how many pairs have been sold. How did you collect all this data, though? Yeah. Well, so at the time, the only real place to see that was Flight Club used to put out some prices every now and then. 
But inherently, we all knew that Flight Club was overpriced anyway, right? I mean, anyone knows you could go buy it cheaper in other places. So eBay was the largest marketplace at the time for the resale market. So that was the obvious place to start. Um, I am not a computer guy. I'm not a developer. But I went out and recruited one of my former startup partners who is. And I basically asked him, I said, listen, I said, eBay's the the place. They have the most sales. Can we figure out a way to collect eBay data? And he helped figure out how to collect it. Now, eBay actually has, in retrospect, it's pretty simple from a, a logic standpoint. So, you know, You've seen eBay affiliate links all over, sure. right? Every sneaker website, right? I don't know. Did you, did you have any at, at sure. uh, right? Yeah. At, so um, that same process that allows you know all sneaker blogs to take an eBay auction and drop it onto their site so that they can get affiliate revenue through that, it was the same thing except instead of us taking that auction and dropping it onto a, a, a blog, we would just drop it into a database, mm. right? And so... My my friend, my former startup partner, he figured out how to basically collect it and drop it into a big database for me, and then I was on my own. And the problem, which I had no idea when I started this, it was going to be all the work, was in cleaning that data, it was trying to figure out what sneaker is actually being sold in that auction. Because as you know, if you go and buy, say, a pair of Jordan 6 Carmines on eBay, it'll say Jordan 6 Carmine, and then it'll say... Yeezy, Kobe, LeBron, and 19 other keywords in the title, right? Limited. Right. Tier zero. Ronnie Fi. Yeah. Da, 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 right? Yeah. And then in the in the description, the guy will tell you, I also have these 12 other shoes, and I sell phone posits, sure, sure. and da, da, da. So, um, so I had to teach myself how to essentially clean the data and how to write queries that basically looked at all the Every the words that were in the title, the words that were in the description, everything we know about the sneaker, right? We know the name, we know the model number, we know when it came out, and and create these algorithms that were literally cleaning data, cleaning eBay auctions with the sole purpose of saying what sneakers actually in this auction. Mm-hmm. And once we did that, then it was easy. Then it's it's literally just math of taking it because you have all these auctions, you know what they sold for, and then you can build a price guide from it. You. This is 2011, right? Uh, at this point, this is uh, mid-2012. Okay. So how long was... Did you ever think of giving up on campus? Mm. Did you ever think... Yeah. Because you know why I say this? Because that's some cool shit. That's some... That's some. I don't want to say some sneaker nerd shit. It is. But it is. But it could, it could be a point where you got to... I mean, I don't know what you're going to tell mm. me. But uh, where you're like, oh, this is cool, but... It, you know who the fuck really wants this? I mean, yep. people like it, but is it monetary wise? Is 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 it something I could turn into a profit? You thought about quitting? Quitting? It? Yeah, it, less about quitting than uh, than than asking the questions, right? The the why and the what. Um, there's two stages of that. So, in the beginning, in creating all these algorithms and teaching myself how to clean it, which took a while. I mean, to create one algorithm for one sneaker took on average about an hour, right? And so if you have 500, you know, I think by the time that we got to the, we get later and, and sell the company to Dan with for StockX, I think we had like 2,500 shoes on the site, right? So that's 2,500 hours that went into just the cleaning of it, let alone all the other work. So there were a lot of times at the beginning that was like, man, this is taking so long for each one of these, like, what you know, why am I doing this? Um, the, the flip side of that was I always it felt like I just got to be doing something and like all right if I'm not going to do this what am I going to do sure what's next right and so it was one of those things that you know and I got to the point where I could you know I could watch tv while I was doing it I could sit and have a conversation with my wife and it was like so I just sort of kept doing it I was like all right let's see what's next let's see what's next and pushing it and then the only other time that was I want to say I thought about quitting but it was was sort of the very end right And, and we'll get to this right but essentially um so during this time that I started campus, I went from having no kids to one kid. Um, and for that period of time, while I still had one kid, I now have two, my wife took everything off my plate for my first kid. I didn't change a diaper for the first 15 months, mm-hmm. right? Wow. Yeah. Um, and, but, but Patricia, my wife, she understood that, I mean, I was working legit two 60 hour a week jobs, right? Between IBM and campus on the side. And, um, and then she was pregnant with our second kid. 
And I knew, I didn't have to ask, I knew that there's no way that shit was going to fly when we got and had two kids that I was going to have that sort of reprieve. I got to do all the good stuff, right? Like, you know, hug her and kiss her and lay her down in bed and, and stuff like that. I, You know, and but I knew once that second kid came. So as it was getting closer and closer to that, and this was still very much a side project and there wasn't a clear route to monetization or to something else. There was definitely the, oh, shit, like, I don't know what's going to happen when that second kid comes. But, like, we might be shutting this down because I, I just I, I can't do that to my wife. Did she believe in it? Like, did she think that, like, it was could be something? She didn't understand the project. Mm. And, in fact, it wasn't until many years later. In fact, it wasn't until, like, she saw my TED Talk years later that she fully understood the business. But she believed in me and it's, and lived with me through other startups, sure, sure. right, and, and did that and supported sort of me working hard towards something. But, no, she didn't understand what I was doing at the time, and I don't think a lot of people did. Well, you got yeah. um, you um, got a hero or you got, like, um, a special moment in your life that not many people get. And what you got was you were being wooed by a billionaire named Dan Gilbert. For people who don't know Dan Gilbert, um, founder of Quicken Loans. Yep. Uh, so Dan's primary business is Quicken Loans. He's the founder of Quicken, which just this past uh, quarter became the largest mortgage lender in the country. Mm -hmm. um, he also is the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Mm -hmm. Um, and he is the owner or part owner of about 130 other companies. Fuck. Yeah. Uh, and pretty much the entire city of Detroit. Um, I and, got a tour <laughs> yeah. and seen some of his companies, and I was inspired. Inspired because this guy, one thing I was really inspired is this guy, from what he's been able to build, you know, and, and his empire, and, and, and even, it's not only about money, but with the money, he's been able to, like, he doesn't go out and hire someone else. He be makes a company out of it. And then you create and you and, and, and then you use it and mesh it within other companies. I was inspired when I left there. But take us through the journey mm -hmm. of how did did you get an email? Uh, what, 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 what exactly happened? Yeah, so, you know, Campus is up and running by 2013. Or, and over the next two years, you know, as people were starting to use it, I was having conversations with everyone in the sneaker industry, right? Nike, eBay, Foot Locker, you name it. And um, and really just trying to figure out, like, what is this business? How do I leave IBM? What what do I do with this? And there was never really a good fit. And, um, and right before Easter of 2015, so coming up now in almost three years, I get a totally cold email from two guys that say, hey, we work with Dan Gilbert. We're really interested in what you're doing. Can we talk? Well, Dan's got no ties to sneaker industry, but sure, right? You take any phone call. So I talked to these guys, not Dan, but you know, two guys who work with him. Sure. And it's like word for word the exact same conversation I had a thousand times. I didn't think anything of it. But then two days later, they call me back and they say, listen, we definitely want to do this business. We definitely want to work with you. We'd like to fly you to Cleveland to go to a game and meet Dan. Mm -hmm. Well, the first half of that statement's like, whatever. Everybody says they're going to do shit, right? But the second half of that, I'm like, Absolutely, you can yeah. fly me to a game, right? Of course. Did they fly yeah. you on a private jet? No, no, okay, no. Okay. Um, uh, you know, that that's kind of the the biggest like you know sort of myth that like you know billionaires just flying everyone on private jets. I mean, the fuel costs more money than yeah. no. Uh, so they paid for my ticket to fly from Philadelphia to Cleveland and and go to a game, and um, we get there. And we kind of make small talk during the game. And then after the game, we go back, you know, in, in this room, private, like, owner's room, and, and we start talking about this. And, I, you know, I, I sort of talk through my ideas with Dan and sort of explain to him this idea that I have that, you know, essentially, if you have a price guide, which is what we were, then we could very easily create sneaker portfolios, right? We could look at someone's sneaker collection the way you look at a stock portfolio and track their value over time. It was a really logical next step once you know the value of one pair of sneakers to look at a whole sneaker collection. And then I had this idea that, you know, if you have asset pricing, the sneaker pricing, if you have portfolio pricing, then it might work to actually build a stock market around that asset. Right. And that was the idea that I had. But man, that was a very pie in the sky idea. Right. I'm not a developer. There's no way I could have built a sneaker stock market. But it was just what I thought made sense with the data. And by the way, I took that idea to every one of these companies, Nike, eBay, Foot Locker, you name it. And every one of them said, oh, wow, that's really cool. But what we want to do is this. Right. We want to use your data in campus for X, Y and Z within our business. And fair enough. Right. Like I didn't think Nike was going to change their whole business and build a stock market with me. 
But I share that with Dan and his guys, and they look at me with pure shock. And they say, yeah, we have one of those. That is exactly what we want to build, a stock market for sneakers. So the crazy backstory of this company is that there was maybe one other guy in the whole world trying to do the exact same thing at the exact same time, and it happens to be one of the most successful business people in the world. Mm. It's crazy. With him having so much power and money, were you able to negotiate and get some leverage out of it? or? So, you know, once we got to the point, you know, we, we, we spent some time. They brought me out to Detroit um, and basically said, you know, he said, listen, you know, we'd like to, to buy campus and have you come here and run the company. And then we entered the negotiation phase. And um, so was that separate or was that together? I like, mean, like when he bought campus and that they got, did that like free you up? And then now he make, you negotiate a new deal? No, no, it was all it was all together. Right. It, the, whole, the whole idea was to take campus and turn that into StockX. Sure. And so for and me to come with it. it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, do you um, do you did you ever say how much uh, you, that he bought campus for? No. Okay. No. Could we say millions? Okay, we'll say mm-hmm. millions. Okay. It was good. Um, but StockX is much bigger. And, no, yeah, and, so, and, so and take, us, right. take us through, yeah. But so, you know, so the process happens where, you know, we, we he brought me from Cleveland to Detroit. You know, we spent time in Detroit, went on the tour that you went on, et cetera, the whole thing. And then spend the time and, and Dan says, listen, you know, we'd, we'd like to buy campus. And that, of course, starts a negotiation. So I go back to Philadelphia and um, and they send me an initial offer via email, and I look at it and I reply back within 24 hours with my comments and with you know sort of negotiating. Well, keep in mind that you know Dan runs approximately 130 companies, so he's got a lot on his plate. Sure. So I send this back, and now it's on him to get back to me. Well. I'm refreshing my phone every four minutes for like a week and a half, right? Wow. (laughs) And it feels like, you know, the longest time. So finally about, it was about maybe 11, 12 days later, I finally get the next reply back. And, you know, honestly, that feels like a year. Because literally like every four minutes, I'm looking at my phone, looking at my phone. And the reality is, is he just has a whole lot of other stuff on his plate that, you know, to sit down and put it together. So, um, so then he sends me a counter, um, and again, I get back to him within 24 hours with mine. And so now I'm in the same thing for another two weeks, refreshing my phone every four minutes. And it's like, holy shit. Like, so finally, you know, I'm, I'm also back channeling through his guys. And so finally, you know, at this point, because I, I recognize there's a, it's two sides, right? I get that he's busy, but there's also like, what does it mean? Does it, you know, why? So finally, I, I say, listen, I said, if you guys can just, I'll come back to Detroit on my own dime. Can you get me back in the room with him? And so we can get this done because, you know, it's killing me waiting two weeks in between all this. And so they come back and they say, yeah, you know, I think it was maybe a Friday. They said, you know, come back. If you can come back on Tuesday, we can find some time with you. So at this point, so I, I come back, uh, fly back to Detroit. And this is a, a great story because what happened was, it was it was the first game of the series against the playoff series against the Atlanta Hawks and the Cavs were playing in Atlanta. The meeting with Dan was scheduled for noon. I get there like 8 a.m. I have breakfast with the guys, you know, and kind of working with these guys and talking to them the whole time. And I'm all prepared to negotiate every single point of this. I know every single part of the deal and the business and da da da. Uh, 11:30 comes and they say, "Hey, the meeting's pushed back to three. Okay, fine. Continue, you know, day. Meetings pushed back to four. Okay. Well, I learned that Dan has to leave for the Cavs game at 5.30. At 5.30, he's leaving his office to go to the Cavs game. Meeting's at 4. Okay, gets pushed back to 4.30. Okay, gets pushed back to 4.45. Okay, so now I'm sitting outside of Dan's office. 4.45, he's not there. 4.50, he's not there. 4.55, he shows up. I know he's got to leave at 5.30. He calls his guys in to sort of debrief before me. They're in there at 5.05, 5.10. I go in there at like 5.12. Right. (laughs) Right. So I know I got this very short window as I am walking into the office. Right. I say to him, kind of making small talk. How's Kyrie's foot? Kyrie had hurt it, had injured his foot before. Man, I got 11 minutes on everything you ever wanted to know about foot injuries. And I'm like, oh, my God, watching the clock. And I'm like, are we ever going to do this? And we got the deal done in two minutes. Literally in two minutes, he sit down and we worked through it and, and we were, we were close enough anyway, and we're able to get it done. And, and by the way, then he, and he's, by the way, he's a phenomenal person to work with. And he's like, Hey, let's go out and tell everyone that we couldn't get a deal done and the whole thing's blown up. And I was like, 
okay. So I'm trying not, I have this huge ass smile on my face and like super excited about this. And I'm trying to like play along with this game to tell all those people that no, it's not working. Yeah, sure, that lasted sure. for 30 seconds. And I was like, you know, um, but you know, we were, we were close enough and it was really lucky. You, you got to understand that, you know, the fact that I was even, even able to get back on his radar that quickly with everything else that, that he goes on um, now was special. And in retrospect, I realized because he really cares about this, about this idea and this business, and which has led to him being really close to it. So how do you so, – so you sell Campus, mm-hmm. right? And then you negotiate a deal mm-hmm. to create StockX. How does that now? Where do you stand today with that? Meaning, like, are you so you're a co founder? Do you have a certain amount of equity? Like, how does that even work? Yeah, well, so first of all, there are right now about um, 120 uh, people that work at StockX um, full time. Wait, that's crazy because I think like last year, how many employees you had? <laughs> this time last year, we had about 35. Actually, right. let's give even uh-huh. some more numbers. Yeah. This time last year, how many orders were being sold a day? Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but it was, uh, it was probably around go by week. Four, it was probably about four or 500 a, you week? Know, a, a day okay. at the time. And now it, it's 4,000. Mm, right? yeah. What's the, what's the, didn't you have a, on black Friday? How many did you do? Yeah. Black Friday. I, I think it's something like 10,000. 10,000. Yeah. Dollars. I mean, it's, it was, it's, it's been crazy, but so back to that. So I was the fifth person. Right, and we now have about 120, and everyone in the company has equity, right, all the way down from the guys that you know unload trucks and box it to everyone up. Um, but the sort of core co-founding team that has the majority of equity is Dan, myself, and then the COO of the company, who was the guy who had started the, the company with Dan before they went out and found me. Mm-hmm. So then they put you like on a salary and stuff like that too. Yeah, everybody has a salary. Everybody has equity. Um, it's pretty typical for you know how most startups work. Um, the atypical part of this is that most startups don't have a you know someone like Dan who is not only the primary investor but also a co-founder. Mm-hmm. And although obviously Dan doesn't work for StockX day to day, we have a lot of the benefits of being part of that family of companies. I mean, you saw it. Um, you know, on day one, we walk in and we have the benefit of working with Quicken Loans HR department and having benefits and having health insurance and all that set up and having the legal department and recruiting and everything else. You walk in to this organization, there's a lot of value that, that comes with that. Sure. Even even UPS. Even, <laughs> absolutely. We'll UPS. get to that. You know mm-hmm. what? Let's take a quick break. Internet's was sitting here with a founder or oh, co-founder and CEO of StockX, amongst many other things. But listen... This is a a, um, a lane and a journey down the entrepreneurial uh, story of Josh Luber. We'll be right back. Don't go nowhere. Log on to StockX.com too right now. Be right back. What's up, everybody? It's Gary Vaynerchuk, a.k.a. Gary V, and you're locked into the Premium Pete Show. Incidents, and we're back sitting here with co-founder of StockX and CEO. What the fuck is the CEO these days? Person that does the podcast with Premium Pete, <laughs> and a person you know, you know, you know, we had a good when I seen you in Detroit. We had a good conversation about um, building, hiring, and also firing. Mm. You know, a lot of people want to be a boss. A lot of people want to build things, create things, but it ain't easy when you have to like let go of people. Yeah, you know, especially when you build something out of passion that actually turns into a business. Yeah, think about that, you know. And and some of those conversations, like I was telling you how my father, he didn't become, you know, he he had so he had so many odd jobs and then he had a good position as I got older in my teenage years. And um man, that guy was like when he had to fire somebody, he, he would come home and be miserable. It was like kind of like something like it, like it was, his hands were sweating and he was like, "Ah, man, I got to, you know. All right, yeah. let's let's go, you know." It's a it's a tough situation when you build any business. I think people sometimes, you know, we want to build business, we want to make money, but we don't realize like it's real life shit. Like you change people's life by hiring them, change people's life by um, promoting them, um, and obviously, I mean, not that saying it's, it, it, it's it could be the person's fault why they're being yeah. fired, it could be whatever. But you know, being a boss is uh, not so easy as people think. It's not, and it's interesting because yes, what a CEO does. There's probably no part of the day-to-day business that I am more focused on than the people, mm. than making sure we have the right team. I mean, look, first of all, just because we're growing so fast and 
we're at 120 people. You asked, you know, lat, lat, this time last year, we probably had 30, 35. And if I had to guess this time next year, we'll probably be over 300. So that's, I mean, that's, and look, the people are everything, everything. Like the, the business, the idea, Dan, all that, it does not matter if you don't have the right people in there executing it. You know, you said something to me about Dan that um, I wonder if he implemented that into StockX. You know, you mentioned about when they won the championship. This was, what, 2016? Yep. I seen, you know, uh, you have a ring. Mm -hmm. I, and I put it on my Instagram, Cleveland Cavalier a championship ring. And we spoke about, you know, how many were made, how many people was made for. And then you told me, I mean, I don't know if people know this, but you told me that he makes one for everyone in the in you know in the company even like the popcorn guy yeah who else anybody else yeah no i mean everybody in the cavaliers organization from the people that work at quick loans arena literally popcorn guys you know all the way up through you know people that that uh that that change the floor and then in the cavs organization right people that work in marketing and you know and then the players and the trainers and everyone else um you know i don't have all the the inside numbers but it was made public that i think dan spent over a million dollars um on rings and that's that's team right that's not the nba doesn't pay for that like sure, sure. directly from the team that um that he spent over a million dollars buying rings for everybody and obviously there's different tiers right the popcorn guy doesn't get the same ring lebron gets sure. right so he, right? He, does he get mm -hmm. the uh cubic zirconia <laughs> yeah I, I mean which is still awesome i no, mean sure, if you've sure. seen some of like you know there's different tiers but even the one that the the ring you know like I've seen some of the, you know, a lot of the ushers wear them around the games. I mean, it, it's awesome. It's this big, it's, huge, it's, beautiful ring. It's good for a boss to treat you like a boss. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and and give you the perks. Like, yo, I'll be honest with you, man. Sometimes I feel like some bosses don't realize that. Like, people will work. People will, you know, but when you give them that little perk here and there, people, people will always stay, you know, boost the morale, man. Like, you know what I mean? Some people don't do that, like, you know. If, if yeah. people aren't happy, people will leave. There are many other jobs. There are many yeah. other places that or you can go. Or slack off. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. That's, and, and, what, that's what happens first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with Dan being like part of the, you know, the StockX and, and, and obviously owning the Cavs, you ever get a chance to meet LeBron? So I have. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, it was very brief. So first of all, um, with Dan and everything being in Detroit and the Cavs in Cleveland, right, there's not that much interaction. Um, but the Cavs came through uh, StockX office and came to visit StockX office last year when they were playing the Pistons. And they were playing the Pistons. They came by. I'm sure Dan had some other meetings with the team, et cetera. Um, we had just done that project where Nike released the Air Zoom generation mm -hmm. on StockX with the sneaker box made out of wood and the Cavs ring. And we had done this whole package. And as part of that, we um, worked with um, with Maverick and, and people at Nike Basketball and LeBron's team. So I'd never talked to LeBron uh, prior to that. But when he came in and they were all there, had a very brief conversation with him saying, you know, basically, thanks for letting us do this. And um, and he told us that, you know, he really liked the way it came out, et cetera. So it was short and brief, but super nice, super respectful. He knew everything about the project that we had done, um, which was cool cool to hear and, and had that. But, you know, with them being in Cleveland and us in Detroit, you know, there's really not that much interaction that happens directly. You know, the name of the company is StockX. Who thought of that? So I'm not 100% sure. Um, we had a ton, a ton of meetings and arguments and everything else around what the name is. The only thing I was 100% opposed to, not unlike campus, was it can't have sneaker kick so anything in there. Sure. Because a little bit different reason, because it was always about the bigger idea that we didn't want to be focused directly on sneakers. I came up with an idea which was Stock Market X. That was I. That was my idea. I remember, and someone shortened it down to StockX. And honestly, I don't remember who. But at that point, there was about seven or eight of us in the company, and it was one of those things that it was like an all-day whiteboard session trying to get to it. And someone took that and shortened it to StockX. And then it also, with any name at this point, you got to be able to go out and buy the domain name. And so we had to go out and and, and buy that domain from someone, and we're able to do that. And that's what, what, what did they have it for? Um. Nothing. They weren't using it. It was just someone who was squatting on on. Was on it a wings. hard sell? Uh, no, it ended up being okay because we we hadn't launched StockX. Obviously, we were still campless, 
and we were able to do it sort of anonymously. We had one of the guys on the team contacted from a personal email, et cetera. You don't want that guy to find out that you're working with Dan Gilbert. Sure, and then sure. he sees, oh, Dan Gilbert wants it. Great. It's $4 million, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, I think we paid maybe like 15 grand. Which okay. right, which for domain name squatting is a very reasonable price to pay it, and obviously we were more than happy to do it and do it before he figures out Dan's part of it. I actually just before, but I want the uh, listeners to know mm-hmm. why StockX is green. The logo is green. Yeah, yeah. Why? Well, so uh, part of it is just is in history because um, Campus, uh, the logo for Campus was green, and I don't know if this is true or not, but in my mind, I've always envisioned data as green. And the original campus logo, actually, I took the, you know, the uh, in the Matrix, where, yep. right, you, the, you looked at the Matrix and it was this green, like, it was like faux code that, like, and so I basically took that, and I, the first campus logo was the Matrix graphic uh, imposed on a Jordan 3. And that's just kind of what I thought data looked like. And so a lot of that has just carried on and... I don't know, and that's where it happened. I I don't know if there was really a lot of thought given when we moved from campus to stock X, but it ended up staying green. No, yeah, I mean I find mm-hmm. that special that you I find that uh, inspiring that you, yeah, you when you think of data you think of green. Mm-hmm. Hey, listen, you know the the mind the mind is a great thing. In the beginning, and I don't know about now, but there's some ambassadors of stock X. I mean, I think like Eminem is a partner or not a partner. Uh, what would you He's call an it? investor. He's an investor. Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't have uh, ambassadors the way that, you know, you have some of these brands like Crep that go out and, you know, essentially. But um, we are fortunate to have uh, a pretty amazing group of um, of strategic investors. Mm. Who are some um, of these people? So, you know, obviously when you have Dan, you don't need to go raise, you know, a lot of money from traditional VCs. You can go to just people that add, you know, strategic value. So Eminem. Uh, Mark Wahlberg, mm. uh, Ted Leonsis, who's the owner of the Washington Capitals and Washington uh, Wizards. But why him? Why, wh- why Ted? Did you reach out to him? Um, Ted and Dan uh, are close and have uh, invested in some companies together. And um, honestly, Ted was in a meeting with us really early on. He happened to be um, in town, and Dan had invited him to a, a StockX meeting, and, and he met and saw what we were doing, and, and he asked. None of these, by the way, did we go out and say, hey, we should go get, you know, some of the most famous people in the world. It it happened very organically. What about Mark Wahlberg? So, Mark, we were in a meeting with Dan, um, and somehow it came up in the meeting that Mark Wahlberg wears a lot of Jordans. Actually, we brought Clark. We brought DJ Clark Kent out to Detroit, and he was in the meeting, and Clark mentioned it. And Dan says, oh, I know Mark Wahlberg. And an hour later, I'm on an email chain with Dan and Mark. And two days later, I'm at Mark's house in California going through a sneaker closet, valuing his sneaker closet and putting it on campus. And it was one of those things where, um, you know, after, you know, sneakers and Dan opened the door, Mark was happy to do it. But as we're there doing this, you know, we're telling him more about the business and asking and asking. And it's him says, oh, hey, well, can I invest? What, like, what, happened sure. with, what happened with Clark? He didn't become an investor? No, I, I, you know, I, I think that he had different ideas about, you know, the way that, that he would want to participate um, because we were in this situation where, you know, we don't need money and we, you know, Mark, we didn't give Mark anything, right? The greatest value we could give to Mark or to Emma or someone is to let them invest, right? They have more than enough money, but to be a part of this, that, that maybe that becomes something else. And so, you know, I, I think Clark just, you know, didn't really want to invest and, and that's fine. Sure. And frankly, that was really early on before we even launched. So, you know, I mean, who knows what we w- might have, you know, become. So who were some of the other people? Um, you know, one of the most, um, truly valuable investors that we've had that has, has been sort of a great ambassador for us, um, is, um, uh, is Scooter Braun. Mm. And, you know, Scooter Braun is obviously a music manager who has sort of made his his bones with, with Justin Bieber, now represents Kanye and some others. Scooter and I actually went to college together and um, didn't, um, didn't like, approach him right away at all. But we were sort of catching up as StockX was, was growing. And, and he said the same thing. He's like, oh, well, can I invest? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And just super connected and smart and gets a startup world and is, has been someone that's opened us up and introduced us to a lot of people. And, for example, um, Scooter also represents or his 
um, his uh, organization represents Carly Kloss. Mm. And so we've been talking to Carly, and maybe we'll get Carly more involved in StockX as well. Mm. But some of the other people that have already invested includes Don C., John Buscemi, DJ Ski, uh, Joe Hayden, cornerback for the Browns. Yep. Um, so, you know, something like that. It's It's been really nice to be in a position where people want to be a part of that. So do they get informed about their investment and stuff sure. like that? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, there's all sorts of, you know, investor updates. And, you know, no one has any obligations to, to do anything with us, right? Um, but we hope that they want to and, and will do things. And, you know, I mean, Mark had us come to this house and and opened up his clock his collection to us and and you know put that on social for us and so it's because it's their investment you know if they feel strongly then they'll also support it and make introductions and do those sort of things so it's a very symbiotic relationship once you know they want to be a part of it sure what's the dan gilbert sneaker game looking like <laughs> so you got any fucking uh ultra boost in the collection danny boy <laughs> no uh you know he is he's not a, a sneaker guy he's um you know, look, uh, I think he's a pretty atypical uh, billionaire. He is a really simple guy. Like Tom's? He, yeah. No, he wears, he likes these, he's got some, uh, like, boots. I, I'm not even sure what brand they are. But, it, you know, he wears those boots almost every day that he really likes those boots. And he's a pretty simple guy. You know, you had so many, you know, different types of startups. You start campus, mm-hmm. it takes you to the next level. It takes your family to the next level takes your ideas to the next level what is what has it been like working with dan gilbert dan is a mensch Uh, he is he is really a a fabulous guy um and there's dan and then what comes with that is the whole organization and and everything else and opening it up and and, you know you were there and you saw it and you know i think you got an isms book right like that isms book like that is dan in a book Right. Um, those beliefs and that sort of corporate culture really does permeate down. You know, one of the good uh, one of the isms in there, um, it's it's the way they, they uh, say it is, um, you know, we eat our own dog food. And what that really means is that you have all these companies and that we are going to actively help everyone else. Right. And we see that and you will see a Super Bowl commercial from Rocket Mortgage that may have uh, stock X in it. Maybe. Really? Right? And so, you know, it's stuff like that. And so you, you come to this whole thing. Dan as a person is phenomenal, but that culture and what he does permeates through the, through through everything else. But I'll say this, is working with Dan and the organization is 95% unbelievable and a dream come true from a, a business person and awesome. But 5%, just fucking kill yourself. Because he still runs 130 other companies, and there everyone always has something that's urgent on fire and stuff like that. And so a lot of times to be able to find time takes a lot of work to cut through everything else and, and, and make sure that he understands that this is important. But to pick your battle smartly, right? Because there are other things that are very important when he's working with Quicken or the Cavs and everything else. And so you got to be able to, to work within that thing. And, and sometimes that can be a little bit frustrating, but you take that with, with all the good. You have an entrepreneur in the making or an entrepreneur that's doing some things. What would be your advice to them? My advice is literally the most simple advice that it possibly is, which is just keep doing something. People ask me all the time at this point, because we do a lot, it, and you know, ha- some version of, of how do you do this or how— Honestly, for me, it's just one foot in front of the other. It's whatever is coming next and make sure, you know, I spoke at this event in Brooklyn earlier today and all that mattered when that was over was, all right, right now I know I, I need to get to Pete. And that's and as soon as I leave, I will look at my phone and figure out what is next and just keep going. And that's the same thing as in the early days when I was doing campus and, and cleaning all this data and spending time writing algorithms. I didn't exactly know where it was going, but I knew I had to be doing something. If you put that down and instead of trying to actively do something, you're watching TV or, or you're going – it's fine to take breaks, by the way. I'm not saying that – but like you just have to be doing something and moving forward because you don't know – What's going to happen? I could never have predicted that that Dan Gilbert was going to walk in the door and have the exact same business idea that I had. Timing, man. Right, right. But if I hadn't been constantly working, constantly moving that point, right, it, that that would have totally missed me. Right. With Dan, uh, what's the biggest? Um, I, I guess I would say, what's the biggest? You know, lesson that you learned from him with your business wise 
or even just working with them. Passion for the process. And I absolutely have that. And the more you see the people who are successful at the highest level, it's about the process. Look, Dan's made his money, so it doesn't really matter, right? But to do what he does, he has to love the process of doing that. And you, when you see that in other people at that level, you start to understand it more about yourself and everything else, right? You have to understand the process. If StockX works out great and we all make a lot of money or we build a revenue history product, that's awesome. And that would obviously, but like, you got to love the the journey to get there. Like, that's the the part of it. And I do. And that's why no matter what happens with this company, good or bad, it'd be like, what's next? Sure. Go out and we do it again. How the hell do you, one thing I, I, I admire about you is that, and I'm sure it's tough and people don't really get to hear this a lot, I'm sure. But it's like, you know, you, you went from being like a guy who did startup and did data numbers. And then now it's like you fucking running this whole company. It's like there's 130 people now. There's tons of uh, investors and there's tons of different things going on. You, you got to build the company more. Who knows? There'll probably be 300 next year of employees. But it's like you, you kind of just like not saying that you're not knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. Of course you are. But you're like kind of like it's like turned and in one second. It's like, okay, here I am now. It's like making these big decisions, running this company. Like has it – I mean – you, did you walk into your own, you know, where you feel like, okay, I could do this? Like, you ever felt, like, nervous or? Not nervous. Um, honestly, right now, so I've always been a CEO, not necessarily in a good way, right? I have always been a jack-of-all-trades, master of none, mm-hmm. which in a lot of ways makes you unhirable, right? And I've I've even had people tell me that when I've applied for jobs at a different point in my life. It, it allowed me to become very good, although not an expert, in data very quickly in order enough to be able to build campus and do this. I wasn't doing, you know, super high-level data science work that, you know, NASA engineers are doing. Like, no, like, I was not a, a PhD in, in data science, but I was good enough, quick enough to get to a point and, and build this product. And so as a CEO, you really have to be a jack of all trades, right? And it doesn't matter if you're the master of any because I need to be able to look at different parts of the business and very quickly understand, yeah, here's what's going on in customer service and how do I help that organization do that and how does it play in with the rest? So I really feel like I've having a larger organization now and being able to hire those experts in those areas, right? The guy that runs operations and runs our supply chain, he's way better at his job than I am at mine, but that's how it's supposed to be, man. That guy is a true expert there. So I'm I'm finally feel like I'm in the right job for me, which is I get to really leverage that across that. And I can go in there and I can help that guy, but he's the true expert, right? And that's actually a really fun part of being CEO of a large company. With StockX, it's obviously moving into multiple different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, bags, you got what Louis Vuitton bags yeah. and Gucci and, and watches, I believe. Watches. Uh, what else is next? So right now we're in four sneakers, streetwear, watches, and bags. Mm-hmm. Um, the immediate way we start to grow is to add other streetwear brands. So right now it's really just Supreme. We've started add some Kith products. They don't resell nearly as much as Supreme, but they also don't really make fake Kith stuff. Um, sure. We're about to add Bape. That'll be a big one. Sure. Um, and so as we add other um, uh, products and other brands to streetwear, then we start looking at what other verticals. And I got to tell you, we don't have that next one for sure. But I'll tell you some that, that are interesting. Um, art prints. So you look at sort of limited edition run of 50 cause prints or 50 Banksy prints. Um, that's pretty interesting. Those are essentially commoditized and, and trade with a premium and look a whole lot the way sneakers look. Um, uh, toys and action figures, star, you know, Star Wars and and How about bear uh, bricks? cause fix and bear bricks and all that. Really interesting market. Um, there's some some problems that we don't necessarily know how to solve yet. There's a lot of fake bear bricks that are really hard to tell. Um, also, a lot of the things, particularly Star Wars and that sort of figures, have a much lower price point. 
So at an average price point of 20 and $30, can we afford to have two shippings on it? Can we afford to authenticate it and, and bring it in the process? Wine is a really good one, but there's a lot of legal restrictions on shipping wine. So there's none that we've gone as far in saying we're definitely doing that next, but we've done a lot of research into these to figure out what might work. And my gut is it'll be around finding that expert. So if we walk in tomorrow and find the guy that's an expert in, I don't know, classic guitars, right, and really knows that market and knows how to build that, that, that catalog and authentication on guitars, then maybe that's where we end up next. But right now, and at least for the, the immediate future, the focus is really just on growing the four verticals that we have. Mm-hmm. Five years from now, where do you see StockX? You know when you go for an interview, they say, where do you see, where do you see yourself from five years? I hate that fucking yeah. question. And then here I am asking you, where mm-hmm. do you see your company in five fucking years? <laughs> Um, it's IPOs. It's literally releasing consumer goods as an IPO where we work directly with brands, Nike and Adidas and Louis Vuitton and Rolex and, and, and literally creating an alternative channel for brands to sell product. Instead of selling products through Foot Locker and through your traditional retail, you sell it as an IPO. And what that really means is you're selling it as into a a true market value and you're letting Nike sell a pair of Jordan 4 cause for more than retail in some version that it goes into the market in the same way like in in the actual stock market when an IPO of Facebook stock happens it gets released into the market and that same market continues to trade it so it's blurring that line between what is retail and what is resale it's one single market and the idea of Campbell is (laughs) <laughs> the, the idea of StockX is to create one single market that brings together retail and resale in one place. And so that's our goal as we work with brands and, and the longer vision. Short vision is we keep pushing in resale and other verticals. But in the longer term, it's working with brands to create an alternative channel for them to release product. You've done a collaboration with Nike. Mm-hmm. Um any other ones on deck that you can mention? Well, I'll tell you one. We, we just did with um, a brand called Shinola, which is a, a, a watch uh, brand out of Detroit. Um, so Shinola, and I'm not a watch guy, but Shinola um, had only made to this point quartz watches. They had not made any watches that have a mechanical um, – that was a mechanical watch. And in the watch world, that was a really big deal when they came out with their first mechanical watch. And they did that IPO with us, and they released some. They had, it was a very limited number of watches, and they released some of them with us. So that was our first watch IPO. Um, and there's none that are on the immediate horizon that I'm uh, at the point that we can talk about it and announce it. But a huge part of my job is every day just with brands and and retailers and everyone else. And pushing that and to do that. So hopefully there'll be some some to announce soon, but none ready to announce here. Mm. Well, what's the uh, top selling sneaker on StockX? It's always a Yeezy. God, it's amazing. Let me tell you something. I said this the other day, and uh, it has to be said. Kanye West, love it or not, like it or not, the guy's a genius. And genius because of just never giving up, maybe, or just continuing to make someone put his dreams into reality i mean they could do no wrong you think about it those whatever they put out it's 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 insane it's it's i mean i fell in love with the game from that 1985 jordan one yeah and what someone falls in love today is totally different but that's okay yeah that's that's what you would want in hip-hop too and i grew up loving kane and chuck d and ice t and biggie and and, and 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 so many people like, but today somebody else's rap heroes could be Migos, yeah. and Twenty One Savage, and that's okay. But it's amazing what he's been able to do. It is, and and I mean, probably the biggest thing I've seen since Jordans. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and and Adidas has played it really well, right? They played it really well by not oversaturating the market and not going too fast. You know, this last release when they did the the three colors and two of which the the blue tints and the beluga too. I don't know um, inside info, but uh, it's rumored there were half a million pairs of each of those that were put into the market. Mm. And even at half a million pairs, they were still reselling for for 2X, 
right? Mm -hmm. And like that's the sweet spot for Adidas to to get it, sell as many as they can, but still not cross that threshold, right? If they put out a million pairs, maybe it would have. Because the second that Yeezys don't sell out, the second that Yeezys don't resell, all of a sudden, man, like the whole thing starts to, to collapse. And so, you know, I give it to Adidas because, look, they got to want to sell as many as they possibly sure, can. Sure. And I think they've done a good job of, of you know, of not oversaturating the market with Yeezys and keeping and and running Pharrell and, and the human race off that as well and doing a good job with that. So I think Adidas has done a really good job around that. And, you know, to your point, like... Kanye put himself in that position, and uh, and he's certainly. I mean, it's phenomenal, but absolutely, like today, Kanye is is Jordan to us, right? Like, yeah, yeah. it absolutely is. It's crazy. Do you think uh, Jordans are on the decline? They are one hundred percent on the decline, and they have been for the last year and a half. But I think that um, there's no way I'm, I'm not counting them out. Like, no way. They and they understand the problem, right? The problem was oversupply. And you, we will absolutely see. And again, this is not inside info, but I, like, there's enough people there that understand what's going on, that we will start to see them pull back supply, pull back the number of releases, and get back to a place where they will, you know, they will sell out, and and you will get to that. But you know, they definitely lost a big chunk because, to your point, that kid today, he never saw Jordan play. He like so it's purely it's purely about the sneaker and by losing that that sort of continuity of having Jordans always sell out, it'll be hard to get back to where it was five years ago. You know, something I never thought that we would be talking about Jordan on the decline like this, meaning in the uh shoes and sneakers. But I will say this, keep in mind, a lot of us, you know, like like if my brother seen me growing up in Jordans, he wore Jordans. Yep. Because he was like, yo, my brother had all the fours and the threes and the sixes. Now, I just think basketball shoes are on a decline. Well, that's it's, for sure. Yeah. You know, people like to wear, you know, the, the, the fly knit, you know, more comfortability. People don't want really like any type of bulky, you know, yeah. people, you know, keep in mind, you know, so that alone. But more importantly, I just been amazed on how many good sneakers Jordan Brand has made, but yet they're still sitting. There's, it's just oversupply. Yeah. And there are good sneakers, and you and I can and appreciate that. But you know, I don't know about you, but I don't. There's just to me, there's there's too, there's oversupply, but there's also too many new colorways. Like, like, did you get excited about you know every new eleven that came out this year? Yeah, no, I know what you mean. Right, and it's like, and I, I love the eleven as much as anyone, but like, like I didn't find myself needing to go get the all red one or the. You know, the Georgetown one. That was cool, but, like, I didn't feel the need to, to go get that show. I'll tell you one thing. I got a lot of respect and, and, and uh, for uh, customizers, you know, I like Mosh and mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, I like, um, what's his name, Dank? Mm-hmm. Uh, is that his name? Yeah, I, I know who you're talking about. Cool kid. Yeah. I mean, I hung out with him a couple times. I've never met him. I know Mosh. He's a great dude. Dank is, mm-hmm. is, is ill. Uh, the guy Kick Asso, I think he does o- mm-hmm. uh, Odell's kick. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is I never really like customizers. Because you can never tell what was real or not. See, growing up, let me tell you something. You, I could tell a fake Jordan in a second because they never made that colorway. Right. If I seen somebody coming in with a fucking purple Jordan, <laughs> yeah. I was like, bro, those are for Gazy. Yeah. Then the customizers came and they started making all these yellows and fucking. I'm like, whoa, whoa, right. what the fuck is going on? But you're right. The, the the brand, I think the brand took on their own customizing and yeah. changed the thing. For a while, it was, you know. I'll be honest with you, love it or hate it, some good sneakers came out of retroing. Oh, you yeah. know, like I, I love OG colors of the four, First. the three. But I'll be honest with you, when they made the the, the, the Toro Bravo four, uh-huh. that's a beautiful sneaker. The Fear four, uh Fear's be- nice. Yeah, beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know, just like so I guess, you know, it's about evolving. There, the, look, there were some I'm not saying all new colorways are bad. And and there was a lot I mean my personal favorite shoe, the shoe that I have more shoe than anyone, is the Jordan 1 Lance Mountain White. Right? Really? Yeah. And that's, you know, here's not always a, a new color. You got this new paint thing and the whole, you know, thing. I just love that shoe. I have six pairs. I don't have six pairs of any other shoe. Top three sneakers of all time for you. Well, if you're just going models, right, the Jordan 1, Air Max 90, and Air Tech Challenge 2. Mm. Like, those are the three models that I have the most of that I'll, I'll wear any day. 
and I like that. Specifically, like, you know, the Lance Mountain White is the one that I have the most pairs of. I have six of that. But those three models are, are the three. You know, uh, as we wind this episode down, you know, even though you're not going to make numbers, I will say it's fucking inspiring to know that a kid who nerded out on data <laughs> has become a millionaire. You, you don't have to. I mean, even though money is not everything, you're, 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 you're a nice dude, man. You're a good dude. You're a smart dude. You're a talented dude. Thank you. But I will say... Just fucking nerding out on some fucking campus numbers to turn into a millionaire and, ter- and really just, like, provide for your family, man. I mean, even though your father's a lawyer and stuff like that, have you, have you been able to do any, like, cool things with him with the success of the company? Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know, it's— um, Don't tell me you bought your dad a station wave. <laughs> no, on. no, no. Well, like, we're not in, in uh, Dan Gilbert territory, right? So there's a, there's a long way to go. But um, it's nice to have a little bit more, you know, security, you know, just in general. And, and to, but honestly, like StockX is the like that's the, the true lotto ticket, right, mm. to, to get to that. And, and we'll see, you know, what it can become. But, you know, in our mind at a, as a business, like this is it's eBay, Amazon, StockX. Like that is the, the type of tier that we're looking at. And if we can actually go build a business like that, yeah. Mm. That's hey, listen. Mm. The the opportunities are endless, man. I mean, uh, I could sit here with you all day and chop about sneakers, but the journey yeah. I think is the most important thing. The yeah. Never giving up. You know, think about it. Somebody who who was uh, doing a computer, uh, mm-hmm. you know, computer consultations for fifty bucks was it an hour? <gasps> yeah, yeah, that was, was an hour. Say, look, yeah, that and and it wasn't even me. It was sending you know, sending uh, Georgia Tech students out to do it. He said, my first business, man, was selling chewing gum for 25 cents a piece. Yeah. Or you said you mm-hmm. had, what, four employees? That was, yeah, at Later Yeah. yeah that, the, when we had the, the restaurant scheduling business, there were four people that worked for that company. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now we're looking yeah. at 130. Yep. And we're hiring, man, so come out. We're, really? I mean, we, we're hiring nonstop across the board in, in pretty much everywhere. I hired engineers Wait, forever. Email? Our, yeah, yeah. Just email me, Josh at StockX. Absolutely. They're, we're hiring. And you can go to the website. You can go to com and, and see all the different jobs that are listed. But right now, we're just hiring basically across the board. It's great to mm-hmm. hear you know, w- w- what's happening for the community. Because it's funny. When I mm-hmm. seen you, like, we can't, like, you wish you could hire more people. Like, meaning, not meaning you wish that you could go out and hire. Like, you wish you could just find the people you're looking yeah. for because there's positions available. Yeah, yeah. Listen, it's a beautiful thing. I, I can't wait to see what's next. Like I said, the journey is inspiring. Not only to me, I'm sure people worldwide are going to love it. You know, like I said, even thinking about just the four employees, thinking about just, just you know, never giving up, and thinking about numbers, and thinking about, like, honestly, I feel like you give a chance for people to be like, oh, I could do, I could do something. <laughs> you want to hear something really funny? So my brother works for StockX. He was actually one of the first people that I hired. Really? Um, what would you hire him as? So my brother helped with Campless on the side when we were doing this because – like me, he also loves sneakers. He can do a little data work. He can, he can write a little bit. He also went to, you know, my father also punished him by writing, so he's a good writer. So when I when I went and worked with Dan, um, we were still running Campless in the beginning before we launched StockX. So I needed someone who understood everything about Campless. So he was the first person that I hired. Today, he's like marketing director for sneakers and sort of works in, in marketing. Um, so about three months ago, um, we were sitting with my parents um, at my parents' house. And it was my parents and my brother and me. I don't know where my wife was. And we're sitting there. And it was like late night after dinner. And um, and my mother asks my brother, what does everyone think of Josh? What do all the employees think of Josh? He, oh. you know, and my brother had a couple glasses of wine. And, uh, and he says, they think, well, if this guy can do it, then I can do it. I see. I mean, that's that's. I was like, thanks, Matt. So it was good. And, and look, and and frankly, I try to be that type of CEO, like that. I'm, like, you know, I like I dress like this to work. Like I'm just, a, you know, dude. I just work really hard and 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 try to be there and and do what I can to help those guys. But it's um, yeah. I mean, you saw what it's like there. That's part of the culture. We're just we're just doing. It. I'm not I'm not a fucking dude in a suit, you know, in an office, you know. As uh, no, like we're all we're all in this together. And, um, yeah, and it's fun to do. You know, you, lastly, this is probably my last uh, question for mm-hmm. you, but, uh, you know, you've seen success, you've seen monetary value. Some people have a hard time celebrating, you know, accomplishments. 
look, you over the past couple of years, you had some great accomplishments. Mm-hmm. I know you're not done. There's a lot to be done. But have you been able to celebrate those accomplishments and how? Um, so it's a fair question. And, and I think you're right that there's a lot of people that, that don't celebrate them. Um, there's the diff- There's a difference, by the way, between celebrating for yourself and celebrating for those around you and your family, right? And that's more important, right? Because for me, like the thing, that, the thing that would make me the happiest is go right back to work, right? Like I just want to be there and doing, you know. Sure, sure. Um, but it's been nice to be able to, you know, to move to Detroit and and buy a nice house and be in a situation where my wife didn't have to work for the past two years. And she's a, she's actually an immigration attorney, and um, she finally went back to work after about two and a half years because she wanted to. Sure. But it was nice for for her to like after we had our second kid to to not have to do that, right? And it's those sort of things where, yeah, I mean, it, it's really about creating the lifestyle for my for my wife and my kids and be able to do that, and that's really the the celebration part of it, and to be able to like to be when we moved to Detroit, right? That like. I was traveling a lot and working a lot and to be able to, to get a, to, to get a nanny when she needed it and to have, you know, extra babysitters or whatever it was sure. to give her the support that she needed. Cause to me, like, I just want to be back at work, but it's, it's really about making her life better and my kids life better. Sure. And I think that's the goal. Yeah. yeah. Just, just making you, making your, your family's life easier. Yeah. And your, you know, like your success is their success. 100%. And your failure is their failure too. And, and by the way, None of this happens if my wife doesn't, you know, all the way back to campus and, and you know, supporting me and, and taking off, you know, th- those child raising duties early on and everything about that, you know, that seems very sort of innocuous at the time. Like, there's no way that happens if she's not support- if she's not supportive. Now I'm on the road about half the time, which sucks. And I, I wish I was home. My daughter's five and a half now. She totally gets when I'm not at home. Right. And that kills me. Right. But I almost never travel on the weekends, so on the weekends, you know, I can make sure and spend all that time and sure, be with sure, them. Sure. But for my wife to understand during the week, and she's the one by herself getting the kids to school and all the other stuff. So yeah, you need someone to like listen. You need someone. I think people don't realize that if you're with somebody, you need someone to believe in you as much as you believe in yourself. That's support. That's yeah. what support is. It, yeah. it's and that's not, success. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's success. You know, I mean, look, sometimes, like I say, people don't celebrate. Like, you know, maybe you came home from Detroit, you popped a bottle of champagne. Yeah, I mean. And they said, this is, a, you know, because it's like almost like surreal, man, to yeah. think of like everything that went down. Uh, yeah. And frankly, uh, we'd sit here and talk for, for a week and go through all the crazy stuff. I mean, did you see the video that I did with Eminem? Yeah. yeah, yeah what? Was, yeah, right? Like, yeah. some of that stuff is just so crazy to think that, like, that's my job, by the way. Like, yeah. Like, what? But, you know, it's all in the, the service of the larger business. And we're fortunate, very fortunate to be in a situation where we have that. And we have M as, a, as an investor. And like that drove phenomenal, phenomenal awareness for StockX. Right. Sure. Like at, like that was a very you know specific business thing that was great for the business. And it just so happened I get to, you know, hang out and, and interview and do a video with Eminem. Like so. It's a special moment. Listen, keep on living your dream. Thank you. Okay? I appreciate it. Internets, I want you to check out StockX if you never heard of it. If you didn't, okay, go on the website and check it out. If you did, I'm sure you're happy to hear his story. It's inspiring. Found, co-founder and CEO of StockX, m- amongst many other things, yeah. Josh Luber. Thank you very much, man. So, I, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I, it was fun. No, of course. See you next episode.